Welcome into the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we get set for the uh, penultimate home game for the Wildcats in 2023. Baylor coming to town as K State tries to get their seventh win of the season and make sure that they uh, at least can't have kind of the gross looking record of six and six attached to them. You get one more win, you guarantee that doesn't happen, and you win. There are a lot of other outcomes that could work out in your favor. And again, K-State is in a position where they could still win 10 games this season. That seems pretty significant and uh, a lot on the line for other things and other players this weekend as well. So plenty to talk about, even though Baylor doesn't provide a ton of ammunition themselves because they have had a pretty dismal year. They are three and six, and I'm not shocked at all that Dave Aranda is floundering at Baylor. Could have told you that. Not a Dave Aranda guy. Uh, anybody that was, you got swindled by him. He he had one good year, unfortunately, since then hasn't been as great. But we'll probably talk a lot more about what K-State can do and what they didn't do against Texas and how they correct it against Baylor because Baylor has not really shown the propensity this season to be able to really prevent teams from doing what they want to do. If you look at what has gone on against Baylor – Texas beat them 38-6. to six. Utah, with like their third-string quarterback, was able to get a substantial enough lead. They won in Waco. Texas Tech dominated Baylor this season. Iowa State got a big lead early. And all, three of the, all four of those games that I mentioned, those were home games for Baylor, not even road games. Uh, the Bears, their two road games this season, they've won at UCF and at Cincinnati. Uh, obviously, if you're worried, like, oh, well, they're pretty good on the road consider the competition that they faced in those games as they get ready to come to Manhattan. So uh, we'll see what the Bears and the Wildcats do for us on Saturday at 2 o'clock. But, D.Y., I'll start with you. Just general thoughts heading into this game, whether it's about K-State and what they need to do, or maybe you have something about Baylor that is worth pointing out. Yeah, they are undefeated on the road. you got to remember one of those road wins was against UCF. Um, and they were losing by four touchdowns in that yeah. game. So – not your typical win either. I would say for Kansas State, as long as they are locked in and engaged in their preparation, so everything that's already happened, actually. Like, what happens between now and Saturday is really not going to move the needle. They needed to be locked in and prepared and in their preparation from Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. So um, the hay's in the barn, so to speak. We'll see how much they were engaged, how much – they refocused and how much they recovered between, you know, what was a heartbreaking loss in Austin to what will be a home game against Baylor that will test their maturity and resiliency and recovery. Because as long as K-State did what they were supposed to do throughout the week in terms of preparation and they aren't flat to begin the game on Saturday and give Baylor a little hope, then this shouldn't be close, right? So, and in the past, under Chris Kleiman, they have responded well to losses. It hasn't been an issue. They haven't really had the hangovers. And throughout this season, they've been dominant at home. They've been dominant against bad teams. So everything we know suggests that Kansas State won't have a hangover, but I don't think that they've had a loss of that magnitude either. Yeah, no, that's a, that's. that's... A good point. And look, I think K-State, the the response after their losses this year, they've been pretty good in them. Uh, it's It's been unfortunate in some ways that uh, they've, they've now been in the position where this is going to be the third time that they have to kind of bounce back after a loss where you feel like, man, if we had just done one more thing, we, we probably come out winners. But uh, th- they have responded nicely and a lot of people will point out that, yeah, the three the three good teams that you've played this year so far, K-State has lost to. That is more than fair because, uh, you know, I, I do that to a lot of teams. I did that to Baylor a lot last year. Baylor was 6-6 six and six last season in the regular season. They only beat one team with an above 500 record, and that was Texas Tech. K-State's in a position right now where they're – I mean, there's a realistic chance, not counting Troy, um, who, you know, obviously they beat in the non-con. But there is a legitimate chance that K-State only beats one team with a 500 record or better this year, and it's KU. Now, Iowa State, if they win this weekend, Iowa State will be in that boat. But Iowa State has to go on the road at, at BYU. So it's not out of the question that Iowa State loses out and they end up 5-7 and seven or something. So 
Uh, K-State could have that type of season, but when that goes down, you still have to give a team credit for not slipping up and losing a game of that magnitude because there are other teams out there that will have that happen to them. I mean, KU is going to have to fight this weekend and not beat Texas Tech. I think KU is only like a a three-and-a-half point favorite at home against Texas Tech. So, I mean, that's obviously there are smart people out there that think that Texas Tech is going to give some good fight and really push Kansas, and KU has to make sure they don't drop that game. Yeah, same goes to said for Oklahoma State. They play at UCF. I think that's at two and a half now. So there's a lot of people that think the Pokes are on upset alert when they go to Orlando this weekend. And remember, they could be having a letdown. They just beat, they just won the last bedlam. Yeah. No, very true. They, I mean, they are definitely in let down spot city, um, bad probably matchup. more so than anybody. It's a bad matchup for the night. So I'm a little, the line's a little stinky there that Oklahoma yeah. State's less than a field goal favorite when you got the league's best running back going against the league's worst run defense. Yeah, uh, it's true. I I don't, Ollie Gordon might have himself a heck of a day. He did in at 300 yards. So. Yeah, I mean, Look, we, I already talked about how easily K State and KU both ran all over, um, over UCF and and Texas Tech. I mean, Taj Brooks, uh, he I believe he had a, a pretty solid day as well. Um, or excuse me, they haven't played yet. It was uh, I was thinking it was getting confused with my rushing attacks. Taj Brooks had a good day against Baylor, um, so that's something to to bring up here in my my look through this week. So. Looking at K-State specifically and this matchup with Baylor that we're so blessed to have on ESPN Plus this weekend, fourth straight week that Baylor is playing an ESPN Plus game. Why are the, to think about? the kings of ESPN Plus, you know, for football, the kings of ESPN Plus for basketball will be UCF. I think they play almost every game on ESPN Plus. Well, yeah, that's just that's just good business by the Big 12. <laughs> uh, this is Baylor's fourth straight game on ESPN Plus and their sixth total this season and given what's left there is a just real chance that they finish the season out there and uh i oof, imagine if k-state fans had to watch six games in the season on espn plus there would be some lost minds the funny thing is i think every most teams or every team has to basically have at least one game on espn mm-hmm. plus i think that's so i think it's like whoever plays baylor yeah. you're on espn plus Yes. Yeah. I not even Cincinnati has been saddled with this many ESPN plus games. All right. Well, looking looking at this matchup, K State got to stick in the college football playoff top twenty five. They were twenty three last week. They dropped just two spots after the loss to Texas. What does that say to you, DY, about what the committee thinks of K State, and then also to some extent Texas, because it's a respect thing there for how good they view Texas that. An overtime loss like K-State had doesn't drop them out of the rankings. Yeah, I, I would say they, they're just kind of looking at the numbers and metrics too. A lot of the metrics stuff, K-State, top 12, top 15, they recognize that they're one of the best three-loss teams in America. You have three losses there against Missouri, who's, if it wasn't for Georgia, would maybe be competing for the SEC East Championship um, because I think they're second, right, still, even after mm-hmm. losing to Georgia in the SEC East. You lost to Texas, who, to be honest, they're, they're still a national title threat. So um, there's that. And then you lost to Oklahoma State, who could go to Arlington, probably should go to Arlington, um, as long as they take care of business. So, And, and you lost all, well, You lost to Oklahoma State by eight. You lost to Texas in overtime. You lost to Missouri by 61 year field goal. The, it doesn't make you feel any better if you're a Kansas State fan. I'm not saying you should. But, man, the margins are razor thin. I wrote this this week. You have a lot of guys making – you have some guys making plays this year, just like last year. They're just not making the play because all their wins are blowouts and all their losses are by one possession or less. Or I'm not saying a fluke, but a crazy deal, like a mere, a miracle 61-yard field goal and a miracle basically red zone goal line stop in overtime. Yeah, no, it's 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 been like paper thin, the margins and the losses, and – K State, unfortunately, this season has either been on the, the the opposite end of a bad bounce, or they just have not done enough. Whereas last year, in some of those games, they pushed themselves over the top and they did enough. Now, I think you know revisionist history. You can go back and look at last year and say that honestly, K State's going to do a very similar thing. Uh, it's just that the rest of the Big Twelve this year is not as good as it was last year. So a team like Texas Tech 
they're not beating Texas this season like they did last year. Or, um, I mean, you, you never know. know. You never know. Well, you, I yeah, you, I mean, it I hasn't think, happened yet, though, is what I'm saying. Yeah, like yeah. last year, at this point, we had already seen some of these teams yeah, right. drop those games. It's just the the disparity between if you are the halves in the Big Twelve this year, which essentially there's like four of them: K State, Texas, Oklahoma State, and KU. Um, you could maybe throw Iowa State in there, but uh, you know it's questionable. Oklahoma, I guess maybe, but the the halves have taken advantage of the lower teams when they've played them. It's just not happening. There's not that playing up ability this year. I would agree. The only thing I said, look, I, I think Texas is going to beat Texas Tech this year. But here is an interesting way to look at that. This is what I was thinking. Is I still think this year's Texas Tech team is better than last year's. And last year beat Texas. Now, the Longhorns, I think, are a more complete team than they were a year ago, too. Quentin Ewers is not going to beat himself as much as he did last year. And he still has the nation's better, not the nation. Um, nation's second best tight end in Jatavian Sanders, probably. Um, the best wide receiver core in the country, perhaps. And, well, we just found out, an elite defense. in Texas probably doesn't get enough credit for being as elite on defense as they are. And Kansas State's probably not going to get enough credit on offense for how they responded to that initial adversity and still put up you know, qu quite a bit of offensive output. Got helped by some short fields, but at the end of the day, they cashed when they needed to. Um, one play short again. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of plays there, a lot of opportunities. Uh, it seemed like for K-State, they thought that they had what they wanted. There were just some breakdowns that ultimately ended up costing them. So we'll see how they bounce back. I mean, how, how we, we've seen it, obviously. Tough losses. K-State comes back. They're ready to go. But it was a little different, I would say, in this game because it felt like that there was one total segment of your, your game plan that was just completely negated by Texas. K-State could not run the ball to save their lives. I mean, how how does K-State respond coming into this game now, and how conscious are they of, okay, we got to get back to running the ball well, and and could they almost commit to the run too much against Baylor? No, I don't think so, because Baylor can't stop anything. <laughs> that, it's really that simple. Yeah. <laughs> so I I just don't – I don't – look, I, I think there could be a little bit of a slow start, um, but I don't think it's really that – you overcommit to the running game again because I don't think Baylor is really equipped to stop it. Yeah, I mean, and that's that was you know I got confused earlier when I was going through there. I knew that one of uh, the the schools had given up a lot of r like heavy running to Tosh Brooks, but if you go through and you look at some of the the games that Baylor has played against, what I would call the better running backs in the league, the better running teams in general, Jonathan Brooks of Texas went for one hundred six on Baylor. Big day for him. Taj Brooks went for 170 against Baylor and a one that's kind of under the radar because he plays on a terrible team. But Corey Kiner of Cincinnati, who is a very talented running back, he ran for 129 on just 15 carries against Baylor and Baylor won that game. So guys that can move the ball, they have done so on Baylor very, very well. And I guess the other one that I should um, throw out there is that UCF had a pair of 100-yard runners against Baylor. Johnny Richardson ran for 105, and R.J. Harvey ran for 95. So the, very, very much susceptible to the run, and, and I think that K-State will be able to exploit that. However, I also think that if you're K-State, you kind of want to play with the shiny new toy a little bit, and you recognize that the offense came out in the passing game against Texas and had their most success of the season – Guys starting to look like they stepped up. Will Howard kind of back to the form that was expected of him at the beginning of the year. I think that K-State is in a position right now to have their the best form of their offense over the final four games of this season with a good blend of run and pass and everything working together. And I think that they probably should go out and try to use both in a, a pretty equal manner against Baylor and not just oh, hey, you know what? We can run all over Baylor, so let's do it. I mean, it's fine if for some reason you find yourself struggling with Baylor and you just need to get the job done, however. But I don't think K-State will be in that position, and I think it would be kind of nice to see K-State go out there, show the balance, get the offense working in a good flow that sets you up best to head into your games with KU and Iowa State that are going to be tougher and ultimately mean a lot more. 
Yeah, it just worries me a little bit. And I agree with that. I'd like a balance, more balance attack, but do you kind of how do you how do you play it? You got KU in a week. It'll be your biggest yeah. sunflower showdown since in the 1990s, probably. And you're probably Texas is a big game. KU's probably your next biggest game after that. I'm not going to say KU, even though it's a rivalry, and your fans are going to feel like you have to win that, right? Because it is KU and you haven't lost them in so many years. The Texas game was still more important than the KU game because of the Big 12 title implications that did exist, but that doesn't mean that this is this is important when they play KU. Does the team look ahead to that while also being hungover a little bit from the Texas loss? You got that sandwich that isn't ideal, and if you're Colin Klein or Chris Kleiman, how do you play it? Do you not want to show KU much, or do you want to just overwhelm them with a ton to prepare for. Those are always two different ideas of how to really attack that. It'll be interesting. I don't think you really do anything quite in the middle. So I, I, to be honest, this is one of the more tougher games on the schedule for me to read this year. I felt like I, I had the script down of how most of these games were going to go. I had the Texas game completely wrong though, because Kansas State couldn't run the ball, but I knew they wanted to establish the run. So I was right that they were going to try. Um, ran into more of a brick wall than what I anticipated. But how hungover is K-State, or does it affect them? It hasn't in the past. How much are they looking ahead to KU? How much do they want to, like, cover up everything and not really show KU anything? Or how much do they just want to overwhelm KU with a lot of eye candy and get them, you know, even more to prepare for? Maybe that's why – maybe they play a bunch of Avery Johnson and Will Howard again to kind of throw another curveball at KU. Like, how much does that KU game in a week affect what Kansas State's going to do against Baylor on Saturday? I think that's an interesting, you know, story within the game here. And maybe nothing. Maybe Chris Kleiman is going to do what he always tells his team to do. Laser focused. It's this game. One week at a time. We're not thinking anything about KU and how we prepare for this game. So can you do that? Will I do that? I don't know. Like, yeah, this game could go a lot of different directions. It's kind of why I think K-State could be tight in the beginning and try to feel themselves out a little bit. I could see a slow start. I don't think they're going to start slow. I think they come out and they start pretty pretty hard and fast. I just The, the way that they've now. played this season, they've done well. And you think about like last week not being able to go out and start quick against Texas, they're for sure going to want to do it here um in this game against Baylor and I okay. think the opportunities there and I, I I think that you can find balance but you can do it in a simple manner against Baylor um and I still like I, you know if you're looking at percentage breakdown wise I still think K-State should be pretty run heavy in this game comparatively but I don't want this to be honestly like I don't want this to be like the Texas Tech game for K-State where there's only like 16 passes total attempted in the game or, you know, TCU, they didn't throw a lot like that. You can run. We know that, but still put the ball in the air and try and make some things happen because I think it's good for the receivers to try and keep stacking games on top of each other. Um, but I don't think you have to go and throw everything out there just to overpower and woo Baylor before you play KU. Cause obviously you don't want to empty the, the book against them. Um, so I, I think that there's a way to have it be done without it being just, you know, okay, here's here's exactly everything that we're going to need to do to beat well, KU next week. Yeah, hell, I'd rather them I'm like I don't I'm not saying this is what's gonna happen either. And I, I agree with you. I, I don't want it to be that much run either. And I because I don't want them to be seen as that team that just never throws the ball either, because that's no fun. It's gonna be hard to yeah. recruit as well, and you don't want that. You know, the more I talked this out with you, man, I wouldn't, as long as it was working, I would I would still abandon it if I was like, oh, shit, this is not working. But, man, I wouldn't even mind. If they just kind of threw everyone a curveball and went 70 80% pass. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I Baylor has been pretty, pretty sturdy against the pass this year, but a lot of that probably has to do with the attempts going against I mean, them because they're so bad against the run. Teams are just like, let's run on them, let's do it. And the game's think- good. Yes. In scripts, because when the other team is pounding your butt all game, they don't have to throw. They're just going to run the clock out and get rid of this game so we can get on to the next. 
Yeah, and, and I think that there's, I mean, there's there's a realm where this can be done in the right style. And like honestly, if you look at what Texas did against Baylor, it's probably along the same lines of what you would want to do if you're K State. Texas was up twenty eight to six at halftime on Baylor, and in the game, Quinn Ewers threw the ball just twenty three times, but he did it for two hundred ninety three yards, and then you still ran the ball thirty four times. And I think if you're K-State, like you want to be around that 20 mark with with pass attempts in this game. Hopefully more than that. You know, you what you would really like is just to to have the ball so much that you get like uh, 75, 80 plays, you get a little you get a lot of both. Yeah, I think that's that my only thing is looking at what other teams have done, especially teams that we we think are at least heavily superior to Baylor, is that the amount of plays that have been ran aren't it's not the highest. I mean so teams are explosive. Yeah. Um, like Tech Tech ran 68 plays on Baylor. Ooh, that's uh, not a lot for them. Yeah. And that and they scored 39 in that game. And Texas ran 59 plays and scored 38 against Baylor. So I you know, you go through these and look, it's not a ton of plays that these teams that have just kind of had their way have had to go out there and run. I mean, Iowa State ran 66 plays against Baylor that's a lot for them (laughs) yeah that's true yeah that's true Uh, and that puts them right in the middle basically of what Texas and and Texas Tech did so I don't know I I think it's going to be kind of interesting to watch and see how K-State handles it because I do think you want to find that balance and you want to be able to go out there and and try and I don't know that it's rewarding but at least kind of keep the momentum going like I, I think it would be a little foolish to go and have such a good week throwing the ball last week and not do it enough in this game to where you can't kind of keep it going. Um, but you got to be smart about it. And I know that they will be, I'm sure, because you don't want to give too much away. But I, I think that the opportunity is there. And also, like, selfishly, I, I again, I want to keep seeing Will Howard throw touchdown passes since I said that he was going to break the record before the season. So we've got – well, I said single season record. I career I wasn't too focused on. I didn't even know where that was at. So uh, how, much, how much for a single season? How much away? He needs six more to tie, seven more to get it. He should he should make it. He's got four Three games teams. left. Four, yeah. Four yeah. games. So he should do it. But I would selfishly, I would also just like to see the three happen this week to get him the career one. Um, I know that some people are like, well, you know, lifetime achievement. Somebody's got to have the record and there are a lot of quarterbacks that have played at K-State, and I get it. You know, the, the year split isn't necessarily the most fair thing, but a lot of quarterbacks that have played at K-State that we revere as being pretty good, and it's a low record for a reason. So if he could go out and do it, A, it's 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 a good thing for him, but also B, it shows that you're catching up to the times. Like I would compare it to uh, my beloved Royals, who for the longest time did not have their single-season home run record be above 40 it was like 36 or 38 or something and finally Jorge Soler came through and took him over the 40 mark I think he ended up with uh, 48 and then Salvador Perez tied him uh, like a year or two later on that so I get it it's small but you got to start somewhere so go ahead let's see it yeah by the way I would fight back a little bit on the lifetime achievement award too and Will Howard I know he played in 2020, but that was a wrecked year, and he didn't go in as the starter. 2021, yeah. he was not the starter. 2022, he was not the starter. Like, he played a bunch of half seasons, and coming in as a backup is not an easy thing to do either. So, And if you're the second-best quarterback in three of the four seasons you played and you still break the record, I think that says a little bit about him and the success he's having. Yeah, no, I, I, w- I would agree with that. I mean – and he's thrown 33 touchdowns the last two seasons. Not like he has the does he have the most starts ever in Kansas State quarterback history? I don't think so. Um, I would have to I would have to check on that, but I, at this point, I I wouldn't think that he has the most starts. No, because he I mean he's had a well, he had one season where he started what six or seven games. Another yeah, he started he, seven he last seven year. What? Did he start six in 2020? I think. Uh, what they played That's nine, like, they played 10 games in 2020, and he started seven of them. I think so seven last year, seven that year, 14 yeah. a season, man. Yeah, so That's only one season, and he didn't in 21, he didn't at all, did he? Uh, in 21, he started the game at Oklahoma State, and he started the game against uh, did he? St- he started the game against Nevada 
then. Uh, those he started those two games, and then Scholars, but and Texas in twenty one. Never forget so he, the start of Texas. This, before this year, he had seven, 16, 17 starts. Yeah, so something like that. That's like a season and less than half. Like, yeah, and he's gonna break it. You know, you know what I mean. Like it's not. Yeah. He's not breaking it because he's started all four years. He's he still has started barely over two seasons worth. Well, and to just kind of put this in perspective, if he were to reach seven touchdown, get seven more touchdown passes this season, which is what he needs to break the single season record, he would he would push himself to in the last two seasons. Like I said, he's at you know thirty three right now. He would push himself to forty. 40 is what Jake Waters threw in his two seasons at K-State, 2013 and 2014 as a JUCO and, transfer. So and base, and he's doing the same thing that a lot of these guys did. He's just doing it in, in less time or the same amount of time, essentially. Yeah, so, and he, so it's not necessarily a lifetime achievement award if, if you compare it to them. Because if we say he started about 17 games, that's what kind of felt right. You add in the nine that he started this year, even though he didn't play all of them, the whole game and a few of them. That's 26. That's exactly two seasons. Yeah. No, that's very, very good point on all of those. So, I don't know. I, I push back on the lifetime achievement thing just because I, I somebody has to have the record, and a low record suggests that, you know, obviously the K-State offense has not been in tune with what a lot of other places around college football have been. This is a step in the right direction, just like you mentioned receiver recruiting a little bit ago. Like, Receivers have not wanted to play in K-State's offense, but that is starting to change ever so slightly because of what Colin Klein is doing to get them involved and how the offense works with the quarterback and everything else. Uh, and obviously, I mean, say what you will about Will Howard, but he's done a pretty solid job the last two seasons now of throwing the ball, and you have a guy in Avery Johnson that you feel like is going to be pretty good in that department moving forward as well. So just uh, a couple things to note. All right. We've talked about a lot here in this game already. Is there anything that Baylor does that concerns you going into this game? Like, we, I mean, it's easy. It, we, it's fine if you just say that, hey, Baylor sucks and K-State's going to dominate them because I that tends to be the way that I think, and that's how the Big 12 has worked this year. But is there anything that K-State should be even remotely concerned about with Baylor? K-State's got to be worried about themselves, I think, more than Baylor. That's the way I feel about it. What I will say is, Baylor is a lot better with Blake Shapin rather than the alternative. So he can play a little bit um, as long as he's healthy. And, man, they've been god-awful running the ball, so I'm going to feel really stupid about this. But Richard Reese was an All-Big 12 preseason pick for a reason, so he's still a talented dude. Yeah. No, that, that's fair. Uh, I just – it what's, what's odd about the Baylor situation this season for people that haven't necessarily followed along with it is that – Blake Shapin has not been their problem, which no, he's if you watch, his numbers are good. <laughs> yeah, if you watched him last year, you thought Blake Shapin is the problem for Baylor. And this entire season, it's not been because of him. It's been literally everybody else. And it just goes to show that even if you have a, a good or average quarterback, they can't save you uh, in a lot of ways. So I just think, uh, I, I think that K-State's going to be too much for Baylor. I don't see anything that, overly concerns me and so i'm with you like it's just if k-state is going to end up beating themselves um then that's going to be the issue in this game but baylor's been weird in a lot of ways this season with how they've operated um i you know people probably think about their running attack and how that's worked out they've been really odd in their their usage in terms of how they've ran guys this year um dominic richardson he's got just 81 carries on the season right now Richard Reese, who, I mean, if you go look at what Richard Reese had go on, he carried the ball almost 200 times last season. He's only He only totaled 57 this year, and he's played in every game for Baylor. That's the odd thing about this is that he is – it's not like he's, you know, been out for multiple games. He is playing consistently for Baylor, and for some reason, a guy that got 200 carries and ran for almost 1,000 yards last season, he's barely touching it. And some of that has to do with the fact that Baylor has found themselves in big holes in a lot of games. But something is very odd and off about how this team has operated this season. And K-State playing a home game, being pissed off after a loss, 
kind of finding their groove in a lot of categories right now. They should they should take care of big business against Baylor, and, and it should not be a difficult task. I would agree. Uh, and if they beat themselves, the only thing I would say is Blake Shapen is savvy enough to take advantage. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's roll on here. Shift into uh, we're going to go a little bit out of order here for a second. We are going to dive into the Big 12 scoreboard first and take a look at what's going on around the rest of the league because the league title race is heating up. It's going on in a big way. And so we will first uh, take a look at what's going on in the Big 12 scoreboard. First game up this weekend in the Big 12, Texas Tech on the road in Lawrence taking on KU, 11 a.m. kick on FS1. Only two Big 12 games on FS1 this weekend. That's uh, quite the deviation from like the standard three or four that end up on there. The Big 12 dominates FS1. What do we expect from KU and Texas Tech? The line is a little interesting for KU being on the, the hot streak they are. They had the chance to get to eight and two, but they are only a three and a half point favorite at home against the Texas Tech team that obviously has had their struggles this season. I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask about KU anymore. I faded them. I had Oklahoma winning that one comfortably over KU. I had Iowa State beating KU last week. Uh, I'm I'm probably done doubting them. Weird line, but uh, it, it might be a very, very close game. I just have a hard time thinking Texas Tech wins. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I don't see Texas Tech winning that game. Just I, I don't know why anything would change. I mean, yeah, they could battle, but if they're going to battle, I, I still think three and a half KU can handle at home yeah. against Texas I will, I will say they've been more respectful of Baron Morton, quarterback at least. It's true. Yeah, K-State definitely saw probably the worst version of Texas Tech Although they saw half of Baron Morton, at least. BYU got full Jake Strong the entire game. So maybe uh, maybe and BYU. That was ugly, right? Work. Yeah, it was, it was ugly. It was not good. Three interceptions again and everything else with it. So I don't know. We'll see what happens uh, there. But it could be a, an eight-win KU team before we know it. All right. After K-State and Baylor go at 2 o'clock, 30 minutes later, O-State and UCF kick off 2.30 ESPN. Oklahoma State, team that is uh, now in the driver's seat to get to Arlington because all they have left are the three newcomers outside of Cincinnati who they already got to play, but they have UCF, Houston, BYU left on the schedule. Uh, it, you've talked about like this is classic trap game scenario. Does Oklahoma State survive the trip to Orlando? It is classic trap game scenario. Remember, UCF almost beat Oklahoma this year. So Yeah. That they were sitting there one and five in the Big 12, I believe the Knights are, but they're not a completely <laughs> like they're not a team that's incapable of rising up and doing something, right? They just can't stop the run. So I think Oklahoma State should be able to survive, but with everyone thinking that's a should be a close game, uh, the books think that, the metrics think that. I just and being a letdown spot, I look the match. It means Oklahoma State should have no problem scoring, but it makes me think, especially Gus Malzahn. Sometimes he can really do some creative things from an offensive standpoint. You know, I have a best bet in this game, obviously too. I will say it, it, it spells out at least that UCF is going to be able to score. Yeah, I mean, I I think that there is a chance that UCF can put up some points, and they, you know, since John Rice Plumley has come back and has played full time they have been able to put up some points it's just he's also made some errors that have prevented them from winning games basically if you look at how it's gone down i mean they scored 28 last week 28 against west virginia 29 against oklahoma um they've put up points and honestly i mean they've been over 30 points in all but uh, a handful of big 12 games uh, so even in losses they've been able to find ways to score but Oklahoma State or 31 on K State. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, asterisk, but you know, that's oh how it goes. On the road. Uh, yeah. So moving on after that, I think Oklahoma State gets it done. I also have a best bet from this game. So we'll get into that in just a moment. West Virginia and Oklahoma from Norman, six o'clock night kick on Fox. West Virginia tr gonna just continue to try and scrap their way through this season. They've been impressive uh, to not you know, falter as much as I thought they could have, 
There were some opportunities there, but they've won two straight, beat up on some newcomers, and now they get to finish out. After Oklahoma, it's a very favorable finish for, for West Virginia. Cincinnati and Baylor on the docket. So we could realistically see an eight-win West Virginia team in a year where we thought they might struggle to win three and Neil Brown was going to get fired. Uh, does West Virginia have a chance at OU this week, a team that has now lost, what, two straight games? It wouldn't shock me if it was close, to be honest, because what we do know about West Virginia is that they have their flaws, just like anyone else, and maybe more than some teams, but they're tough as hell this year. They are tough as hell, and Oklahoma's a fraud, I think. Yeah, well, we know this, at least an advisory right now for Brent Venables. <laughs> Uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, Cincinnati, Houston, six o'clock, FS1. Uh, Houston should win this thing, but I guess there would be the realm where Cincinnati, who is still kind of looking for that first Big 12 win, they really get up for this game because it's their best chance to win one. But the line's only like two and a half in favor of Houston. This could be a game where Houston, I think, probably wins pretty easily. Because I, I actually think, and I wrote I like it this week in Big 12 rankings. I think Houston is like the perfect example of a team that, that they're just not ready to play a Big 12 schedule week in, week out, but they're not a, a bad team. They're just going they're to have some bad games. They're not, and they can play some offense. So obviously mm -hmm. we know that. They have some good receivers. They get thumped really bad sometimes when they play the good Big 12 teams, although they did hang with Texas, so they can rise up too. Look, I'm gonna, I, I think Houston wins that game as well. I think of the four newcomers, and we'll have our Big 12 power rankings out maybe by the time that this releases, but I think Houston's the best of the four newcomers at this point. I think that there is a strong case to be made. I mean, BYU put themselves in position early to have the better record. They kind of stole a non-con win, but I, I think I am with you. And Houston, this would be this would be big for them this weekend because they'd get to 5-5, five and five and their last two games were Oklahoma State and UCF. If they could win two of these last three, Houston's getting to a bowl game this year, and that should be considered a significant win for Dana Holgerson and Houston this season. And and uh, there's a, there's multiple scenarios for Kansas State to try to get their path to Arlington, right? One of them is Oklahoma State winning out. One of them – there's another one I think where maybe, you, maybe Oklahoma State drops a couple of games, right? You can look at it multiple different ways. Let's say Oklahoma State, for some reason, does get upset in Orlando this week. Houston beats Cincinnati, and they're fighting for bowl eligibility. They're going to play a really good game against Oklahoma State. Yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. All right, another night game, Texas TCU. Boy, ABC, giant losers this week to get this game yeah. as their Saturday night primetime game. Uh, look. Quinn Ewers is, is going to start, it looks like, according to Steve Sarkeesian now. TCU obviously has not been that good this year, and I think that Texas is probably ready to go out there and storm past TCU with some ease. I agree. The Horns are so good when they're locked in and, and play a full four quarters, and obviously it's easier to do that when Quinn Ewers is your quarter, quarterback. Rather, <laughs> boys going out, rather than Malik Murphy. And I would say the frogs this year, not they're frauds compared to what maybe people thought they were going to be, but they're the they're frauds. okay. The, the frauds, fraud, fraudy frogs, they're okay. They're just they're just overmatched when they play the good teams in a Big Twelve. That's yeah. really what it is. What I will say is we saw this a little bit last year, and obviously they were good last year, so maybe that played a role. But TCU at night, sometimes a weird place to be. Yeah, very true. We'll uh, we'll have to see. Kind Are they of doing what... their blackout or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good point. I we'll mean, that was a see. very that was a very. Now they were good, so it's different. But yeah. that that was as hostile of a road crowd. Like you go into Texas, it's loud, but it's not necessarily mm -hmm. hostile. They're not like they don't want to like leap over the fence and like choke you out. Like when Kansas State was at TCU last year, they were getting shit thrown on them. It was like, pretty nasty last year. Those TCU fans, I don't, I don't think so there's bad. a lot of love there uh, for K-State and TCU people anymore. So No, uh, and TCU fans, they're probably going to be the same way against Texas. You got to think that there's 
that little bit of vitriol as well. TCU and Texas might be the the two most arrogant fan bases in the state. I know that some would probably make a case for like Texas A and M, but I I think I don't know that it's much arrogance for Texas A and M as it's weirdness. I think for TCU and Texas, it's just straight up snobby, rude. We're better than you. And uh, I mean, both, I think both fan bases are as annoying as it can get. So it's uh, just a little bit more nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Last game in the big 12 this weekend, get excited. This is a taste of what is to come for the future of the big 12 late night kick, 9 15 PM, Iowa state at BYU. Iowa state's still an eight point favorite in this game, but this is a scary situation to go into. If you're Iowa state late road kick, in Provo, BYU's got a pretty good record in night games up there. And yeah. if Iowa State doesn't win this, there is a legitimate chance that they go from standing tied for first place in the Big 12 with four weeks to go in the season to not going to a bowl game and finishing five and seven. I think Iowa State's in danger of losing this. I really do. Um, you're right. BYU, night, home, weird place, weird game. A bit of a trap, so to speak, for the Cyclones. Also, probably a little overvalued by the teams that they played early in the season because of how stiff in their schedule is getting now. It was really backloaded, not necessarily front-loaded. They do have to win over Oklahoma State. That was before the Pokes turned it around that bye week. So I'm a little down on Iowa State, and I would say BYU is a really good bet this week. Um, I didn't make it my best bet, I don't think. Maybe I did. Um, But – I would say the Cougars, uh, I think that they're set up to do something this week against Iowa State just because I think Iowa State may start to implode a little bit. I will say this. If you're Kansas State, they're, again, the tiebreaker scenarios are going to get weird. And there's a couple more likely than the rest. But one of the couple ones that – is maybe realistic. Does it require an Iowa State win over BYU? Well, I don't know about that. I, I think I would just uh, hope for another scenario to work out and, and root for BYU to beat Iowa State. That'd be pretty funny. So, yeah, I yeah, I'm with you there. I think BYU at least covers. Yeah, I the the eight points there seems a, a little steep right now for me to trust Iowa State to to cover the eight points. So I don't know. We'll just have to to wait and see. All right. Let's roll on now. Best bets time. Uh, Here's a look at how it went last week. Did not go very well for me. Uh, I was 0-3. Boy, just Nebraska losers. Uh, And then the situation with with Minnesota, Illinois, they scored points. Couldn't believe it. Um, Actually, it's just because they they scored a few extra points that I didn't expect. And then Will Howard, he about had the over in negative rushing yards, not uh, positive rushing yards. I will say that couldn't do jack running the ball i will say that you deserve that for picking big 10 west yeah i mean for sure that's that's totally fair and that's that's i i wear that and you're right i do deserve that no I'm no two doubt and one. About it. i'm two and one bedlam under got a little close at the end but game kind of unfolded the way that i thought it would senate that was a lock you got that like in the first half yeah. i think um usc I should have took the USC over on points because I was right that they were locked in and they scored a lot. They scored 42. But to cover, you need a good defense. Yeah. And that team in LA does not have one. Nope. All right. Well, here is a look at this week's best bets. Do we have a total uh, record? Oh, no. I, I need to go through and piece all those together. Okay. Uh, you, you're kicking my ass, though, I'm pretty sure is what it would. Yeah, uh, well, it's making it up because I'm getting destroyed on three more. So. Also, and- I – you know, I, I don't want I, I would offend people if I gave out my my actual bets that I was picking, which last weekend included uh, Texas, Philadelphia and USC. Uh, is, so I, I took all three of those teams uh, to beat my teams last week, and it worked out quite favorably for me. But uh, people would probably get a little offended if I uh, went that route consistently. So I'm just not going to tell you that I'm picking against K-State when I do it. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing good on this one. and I think I'm doing good in real life, too. I'm still up on the year. But I think I'm like 10 games under on Power Cat game day. I think I'm like on the we do a lead pipe lock in the week of three mall. I think I'm like one and eight. So it's it's not been ideal 
and the other shows. Uh, I'm fire this one. Colorado plus 10 and a half. Um, they're playing Arizona, who's been hot. Mm-hmm. But I think there are people are starting to probably overvalue Arizona a little bit just because of what they've been able to do. Being a 10 and a half favorite on the road, I think is a little too much for Arizona. And if you go look at what Colorado's done, of course, they have slowed down. Great as, backdoor cover team. Yes. As dogs, they are covering a lot. They even, hey, they hung with Oregon State last week. Yes, and that was a that was a late cover that they they chipped in there. So well, they are it. doing it. Yeah, and then UCF over 30 and a half. We talked about this game earlier. The the books say it's going to be close. The metrics say it's going to be close. Oklahoma State coming off the big huge bedlam win says it'll be close. They're probably not going to stop Oklahoma State's offense. So that means if it's going to be close, UCF scoring too. UCF over 30 and a half. Okay. And then uh, you got the Cats second half minus nine and a half. What, what, slow, what's the thinking behind this one? Slow start, pull away. Okay. I I get it from the sense of K-State against these bad teams has given up nothing in the second half this season. So even if K-State is, you know, if they're up big after the first half and they've called off the dogs, they're still going to score at least, you know, 10, 13 points in the second half. Especially to, when to your, your second unit might be Avery Johnson. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, you've got a better second unit than than a lot of other situations. All right, this week, uh, it's the easy one. It feels like Ollie Gordon over 144 and a half rushing yards against UCF. As we've discussed, UCF, it is a massive number. But honestly, <laughs> no, that, I would take the over too. But it's Ollie hilarious. Gordon, to go for that against anybody you might do right now, let alone UCF, the worst rush defense in the Big 12, Anybody with a pulse and half a leg has ran for a lot of yardage against UCS. So I will take Ollie Gordon over the 144 and a half. And then Mizzou money line against Tennessee at home. Uh, Mizzou's plus one and a half. So if you're just going to take him at plus one and a half, you might as well take a money line. And I don't know, like I want to like Tennessee. There's a lot I like about Tennessee. I like, I like Rocky top. I liked what they were last year. And look, I love Joe Milton. I love the idea of him at Michigan. It did not work out, and I tricked myself into saying, you know what, well, maybe it's time it happens at Tennessee. He's really not been very good this year. They're still a fine team, but the game's in Columbia. Mizzou has been pretty good this year, and I think that Missouri has a lot more going for them to be able to to score than what Tennessee does. Mizzou's defense, as we know, is pretty stout, so I'm taking Missouri at home as the underdog money line. And then I'll just take K-State minus 20 and a half. I mean, they've killed every bad team they've played this year. They've been able to hit that mark. I think they do it again against Baylor. There's a reason why it's a big number. It's because K-State's going to be able to go out there, take care of business. So it's simple. It's clean. But I think K-State covers their 20 and a half fairly easily against Baylor. You know, I set a score on Powercock Indian three mile, and I'm probably going to make a detour there. Yeah, I'm probably going to amend it because the you know you you talk about this game enough, you start to form thoughts and and feel good about how maybe the game will unfold um, to a certain script. And I think I'm coming around to Kansas State covering as well. And I think it's because of a big second half, uh, which is why my number, my best bet for the game is what it is. So I guess we'll dig into that a little bit now. We'll go to yep. we're ready for our pick. Um, I guess we got MVPs. If it goes well for Kansas State on offense, you know what? Give me a receiver. Give me Keegan Johnson. Sustaining. Oh, oh Keegan, we're back. We're back, baby. Keegan Johnson back def- defensively. I'll just stick with a hot hand on defense, too. Jake Clifton's been one of the best defensive players on the field, so I'll stick with him. Yeah, Jake Clifton was good uh, in in spots against Texas, had a big tackle for loss at one point, and uh, it's been big to have him back. And obviously he dealt with some injury stuff earlier in the year, but uh, getting closer to to his normal self. Look, I think for K-State offensively, it seems like the easy answer to go running back. So DJ Giddens victimized UCF, and it's been kind of calm and, and quiet over the last you know couple of weeks. I think DJ Giddens probably has a pretty big day for K-State, even though I would implore them to throw the ball more. Um, I do think that he's just going to be able to do a lot against Baylor. And so I'll throw DJ Giddens out there offensively. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, Baylor has had to throw it a lot 
this year uh, in a lot of circumstances uh, because they found themselves down. And like I mentioned earlier, they're just not wanting to give it to the running backs for whatever reason, uh, just even to begin with in games. So there are a lot of things to kind of think about and look at in these, in these cir- circumstances. Um, but I'm going to go with the defensive back against Baylor for the defensive MVP. I've been on it all year long. It's going to happen at some point. Marquis Siegel is going to end up with a pick six. He at least is not going to let one fall through his hands this week. Blake Shapin's going to put the ball in the air too many times. So I'm going with Marquis Siegel. We'll see what happens. And I'm only going with him because he'll get the vanity stat or at least one of them because in a lot of these games against inferior opponents, the DBs really haven't even been tested in these games. That's that's how good everybody else has been defensively, where there's been a lot of throwaways or you know scrambles for a yard or just a lot of things that even when the DBs have covered well, there's just not been any opportunities for them to get their hands on balls. It's been against these better teams, and they've missed their chances. Marquis Siegel is not going to miss every chance. At least I don't think he will. So I think the stone hands turn into velvet gloves for one game uh, this this year, and it will be this game against Baylor because Blake Shapin will put it on him. Okay, and I, and I could see this game being like a 17-7 to 7 halftime lead, a little bit of a slow start. And then Kansas State basically wins the second half 21 to 7. Uh, so I'll say 38 14, Kansas State. I think this game is going to be fairly similar to the probably the like the Houston game. Um, but I think that K State probably goes out and I'm taking them 38 13. I think that Baylor can probably get a few more scores. There is the talent still, even though they haven't been uh, running it as much they've got talented running backs that could maybe bust through obviously we know k-state's uh explosive run defense has been pretty bad this year so i think baylor can sneak a few points on them but i think 38 13 is probably the number k-state scores a lot of touchdowns early in the game there's probably a kick at some point in there for chris Tennant. 38 has been about the number that a lot of teams uh that that are talented have been able to get to on them like i mentioned texas and texas tech earlier so i'm taking k-state by the final score of 38 to 13. And I wouldn't be surprised if K-State was able to get above 40 as they've been able to do uh, in a lot of these games against inferior opponents so far this season. I forgot to squeeze it in. Wearing the Army shirt today. Oh, big, well. Big, big win over Air Force last week. Yep, great. Just just pre-supporting uh, one of K-State's opponents for next season. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, you know, you know everybody no, forget no. that DUI was doing this. No, I'm picking the rival of a team that already beat Case. It's true. Yeah, never forget four years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, gosh. I just uh, – what's your gut feeling right now where K-State ends up bowl game-wise? That's a good conversation because that's that's a thought right now is that K-State wins out, you think you're in a good spot to go to a decent bowl game, but you just want to avoid Memphis at all costs. I don't see them going to Memphis because I think there's still a good chance you went out and get finished nine and three. Yeah. If you do that, it depends if can if the Big Twelve can get two in New Year, New Year six. But I think they're in the wheelhouse of the Alamo Pop Tarts right now. Yeah, I think so. The Pop Tarts bull guy, he's been to a handful of K State games this year. I think he's been to three of them now. Uh, he was, I guess, at the game in Austin last week. He was at the game in Lubbock, and then he was in Manhattan for the TCU game, I believe, to TCU or or Houston. And uh, the rumor has it that another Pop-Tarts Bull rep will be in the house this weekend. So, they- and K-State's never been to Orlando. We know that Iowa yeah. State got to go however many times for, because Jamie Pollard is a kiss-ass. So, I think, I think that Orlando seems like the likely fit for K-State this year. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Just no yeah. Memphis. No Memphis at all. I, I doubt it's Memphis. I could see Orlando. I'm I'm actually, you know, selfishly pulling for San Antonio. Never been there. Oh, well, never forget the Alamo. Uh we'll see we'll see. The the issue a, is a going to come down to Yeah. The issue a, is going a, to come down to how this all just works out because the Big 12 is probably only getting one team into a college football, like a New Year's Six game, unless Texas wins out and gets help, and so they can be 
in the playoff, and then the Big 12 would get two in there. But I think right now the Big 12 is probably trending to just getting one, which means that that then leaves your second-place team basically up to the Alamo. Uh, so K-State will have to prove themselves to, to get to go to Orlando. Uh, in the what park. I will say is Texas can easily win out, and if they do, yeah, they're in position to maybe be – the, the they can get to the playoff if they went out. Yeah, They're we'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, here's what's so wild about this is looking at the uh, like the way that this works out in the Big 12's bowl selection process this year. It feels like maybe there used it used to be a little bit of a gap, but the the Sugar Bowl and the the at large spot or whatever those are the the tie ins for the Big Twelve. Now this year I think the Sugar Bowl is actually a playoff, so I think the the Big Twelve champ ends up going to like uh, the Cotton or something. Um, but it's just the Alamo Bowl and then the Pop Tarts and then the Texas Bowl and then it's the Liberty Bowl. <laughs> so there's not a big margin for error there for k-state if something wacky were to happen and sorry to anybody that really enjoys memphis it is just not a fun bowl game to go to it's yeah i mean beale street is fun for a night or two but aside from that there's not a lot in memphis and in the bowl game itself is pretty mm. yeah yeah it's 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 same weather as it is here it's like 40 degrees and it's a dumpy stadium and uh no never again and then i've my my Memphis experience with John and Mitch on the road at Cayman was sharing a bed with Mitch and falling asleep on New Year's Eve in the hotel room when I had ordered I'd ordered pizza and I woke up to like a thousand calls from the delivery guy and I was just like I've had a long day working just just keep it to yourself Happy New Year and I wasted like twenty dollars on pizza that was delivered to me so yeah well, not my I- place. I ate a burger of crystal and mustard on it. And if anyone knows me, I have a, the biggest aversion of anybody to anything to mustard. And, you know, a little hungover. But that mustard did not stay down. I, it's it's literally repulses me. I can't stand mustard. All right. Well, we found out one key thing uh, in this KSO show. It is that D.Y. is the guy at baseball games that is vigorously rooting for either ketchup or relish to win the hot dog race and is probably screaming F you at mustard coming down the, the first baseline when he's about to cross the ribbon and get the win. Just good luck to the mustard guy if Derek Young is attending a game because you're going to hear it from him. So we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. For for all the mustard lovers out there, don't, don't share that love with D.Y. All right. K-State, Baylor this weekend, 2 p.m. It's on ESPN+. Plus. Unfortunate that you guys that won't be at the game have to deal with that. My condolences. Hopefully the, this is the last game K-State has to play on it all season. I think it will be. And if you're Baylor and you're sick of playing games on ESPN+, Plus, try not to suck. All right. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. This has been the KSO Show. Stay locked in with everything we got going on at K-State Online. Over on On3, lots of great information in the lead-up to the game with Baylor and also lead-up into the game with Bellerman as the Wildcat basketball team opens their season, at least the home season, tomorrow night, Friday, I guess. This is when it's coming out, so today we're recording this on Thursday. But Friday night, Bellerman going to be a nice weekend. And also, shout-out to Jason Mansfield and the K-State volleyball team. Swept number 3 Texas on Wednesday to uh, have a pretty impressive victory there. Three straight wins at home against uh, some top 10 opponents for the Wildcats, and they're doing it in dominant fashion. So things are going pretty well for K-State sports right now. Football tries to continue the trend on Saturday as they look for win number seven against Baylor.